Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Thomas Bloom, who's visiting us uh, to try and conjecture. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. It's a real uh, pleasure to be able to speak um, to Stony Brook from Cambridge. Um, I'm just going to try and share my slides now and get them up on screen. Hopefully they're all visible to everyone. If not, somebody will wave or make a commotion somehow. Um, so let me just get my screen set up here. So I'm going to have this, this chat window uh, open in the corner down here, which hopefully isn't blocking anybody. Um, and then if you, I encourage if there are any sort of questions or comments during the talk, then feel free to sort of put something in the chat window there and I'll see out the corner of my eye. But of course, there'll be questions at the end as well. Um, so I've tried to make this a talk which is accessible to everyone, um, even if you're completely new to the area and the kind of question we're talking about. But also, um, hopefully there's something there if you um, are quite familiar with this stuff already. Okay, so this talk is going to be on finding arithmetic progressions. So I'm going to begin by um, just sort of giving a very brief uh, slogan view, I guess, of what additive combinatorics as an area is all about. Uh, it's an area that's really quite hard to define, I find often, because it's easier to say what it's not. So it's definitely not just combinatorics. It's definitely not just number theory. It's kind of a bit of both and then some other stuff as well besides. So here's one attempt at um, a kind of a definition of the area, which is additive combinatorics is about finding weak additive structures under weak hypotheses. And there's two things to emphasize about this. The first is that uh, the kind of structures that we're talking about are definitely additive structures. So they're structures that you define with some kind of addition, for example. So that's sort of what differentiates it from regular combinatorics or extremal combinatorics. And then the hypotheses that we're working with tend to be very weak. So in particular, we're thinking of working with generic sets of integers, for example. And so we're not limiting ourselves to just working with the primes or the squares or the cubes or anything like that. And that sort of differentiates it from more classical number theory when you're sort of working in these very special arithmetically special settings. And OK, so we want to study weak structures under weak hypotheses. Uh, essentially, the weakest kind of structure that you can really come up with um, that involves some addition is a three-term arithmetic progression. OK, so that's just three numbers uh, which have equal space between them. OK, so x, x plus d, and x plus 2d. Um, there's not really anything interesting that's still arithmetic on two integers, and on three integers, you know, basically, that's, it's arguably the simplest kind of additive structure that one can look for. And so I think one of the most natural questions, certainly in additive combinatorics, um, depending on your view of things, possibly the most natural questions in the entirety of mathematics, but maybe that's um, selling it a bit too grandly, is to ask what conditions on a set, let's say a set of integers, um, are enough to guarantee that it contains a three-term arithmetic progression. And because arithmetic, three-term arithmetic progression is in some sense the weakest possible kind of structure, really we're saying what is the what kind of conditions in a set are enough to guarantee that it contains some kind of additive structure at all. Right? It's not just from the point of view of addition, a completely uh, unstructured um, sparse set. Okay, so let's begin with some examples. So obviously there are infinite sets that contain no three-term progressions. So for example, the powers of two contain no arithmetic progressions at all, basically because the gaps between them um, grow exponentially. But obviously the powers of two are very sparse right? and they're sort of tied in with the reason um, why they don't contain three-term progressions. They don't contain three-term progressions because the gaps between any two successive members are growing exponentially each time, um, which both forces them to not contain a progression, but also forces them to be very, very sparse. And you can play around with ideas like this. Um, and it seems particularly very hard to come up with any other way of ruling out um, an arithmetic progression. Right? It's really hard to construct um, any sort of reasonably large set of integers without a three-term progression, um, without being forced to go into the, the sparse, you know, lacunary exponentially sequencing 
exponentially increasing gap behavior. And so this kind of question was considered quite a while ago. So the first, um, I think really the first sort of recorded in the literature um, consideration of this question was Erdős and Turan in 1936. And it's a, it's a really nice sort of short paper, maybe three, four pages long. And there they were really the first to ask um, what do sets without three term progressions look like and must they be sparse? So they proved a couple of elementary estimates um, by sort of simple combinatorial arguments. Um, and I think most significantly, they conjectured the following. So they conjectured that if I have a set of integers which contains no three term arithmetic progressions, then in particular, A must essentially have density zero. Or more explicitly, if I look at the uh, proportion of A that lies inside the first n integers, then that must go to zero as n tends to infinity, right? which is one way of measuring how sparse the sequence of A, sequence of A is. In fact, in later years, Erdős conjectured something even stronger than this. Um, so he conjectured that if A is a subset of N, it's such that A contains no three-term arithmetic progressions, then the sum of the reciprocals converges. Um, okay, it, it's, a, it's a basic exercise in sort of first-year analysis uh, to check that, indeed, that is a stronger conjecture um, that it is. So the first conjecture is just saying that um, basically if A contains no three-term progressions, um, then A must be sparse, must have density zero. The second is saying that in fact A must have density uh, density zero, but in fact density going to density going to zero at a reasonably fast rate as well, which I'll get onto more later. Um, how to um, in, in my introduction, in fact, uh, Bob, meant, Bob mentioned described this as the Erdős Turan conjecture. The uh, so origin, origins of this conjecture are a little murky. I don't think there was ever actually a sort of a paper where Erdős conjectured this. It sort of first appears in several talks that he gave around the 60s or 70s, and then in compilations of his favorite problems. So it's definitely a, a problem that Erdős came up with quite a while ago and was talking about for quite a while. And he often mentioned it in connection with um, Turan or in Turan's honor and Turan's memory. Um, but to sort of, to avoid confusion, I'm gonna, the, the Erdős Turan conjecture, I'm going to refer to the first conjecture and the second one is the Erdős conjecture. So as I say, the first conjecture that if A contains no arithmetic progressions, then it must have density zero, was conjectured by Erdős and Turan in 1936. And it was some time before that was proved. Um, certainly the sort of the quite elementary combinatorial tricks that Erdős and Turan used in their paper sort of just really aren't enough to even get close to this conjecture. You need um, something fairly sophisticated new ideas. And these were introduced by Roth in 1953. Um, this was very shortly before he won the Fields Medal. Um, yeah, sort of, in, in fact, I think it was in the same year that he proved um, the other Roth theorem on Diophantine approximation. So it was clearly a very successful year for him. And Roth proved this conjecture of Erdős and Turan. So if A is a subset of the integers that contains no three-term progression, then a must have density zero. Um, the sort of the stronger version of this conjecture um, took a while longer to be proved <clears throat> and it's the main result that I'm going to talk about today. So this is result is joint work with Olaf Sisask. Um, so sort of all the anything novel in the, that I mentioned in this talk is all joint with, with Olaf Sisask at the University of Stockholm. Um, the paper appeared in the archive I think July this year. Um, so we show that if A is a subset of the integers such that A contains no arithmetic regressions, then not only does A have to zero density, but in fact something even stronger, the um, set of the sum of the set the sum of reciprocals of A must converge. As a consequence, for example, we know that the primes have infinitely many three-term arithmetic regressions because as a very basic number theory fact that its sum of reciprocals of the primes diverges. Okay, so this is um, not particularly interesting because this fact was already known since the 1930s. So it's sort of one of the first real demonstrations of the um, circle method in particular, of Vinogradov's refinements of it. <clears throat> but in fact, we get something even stronger that any dense subset of the primes have infinitely many three-term arithmetic regressions. 
All right, as long as I have, say, 1% of the prize or something, then I'm still forced to have infinitely more three times arithmetic progressions. Okay, but that fact as well was actually already known. So that was proved by Green, uh, Ben Green in 2005, um, using sort of the transference method. And then that transference method was then generalized and improved by Green and Tao jointly um, to prove the famous Green Tao theorem that the primes contain um, arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. In fact, even stronger, um, any dense subset of the primes must contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Okay, so these consequences are already known, but I think what's really striking about this is a corollary of um, this combinatorial theorem I mentioned on the previous slide, is that we know this is true for the primes not because of any sort of special number theoretic reason, not because the primes are distribute in a certain way in congruence classes or anything like that, um, simply for the fact that there's a lot of them. So just from knowing the fact that the, some, of the, some of the reciprocals of the primes diverge, for which there are many um, elementary proofs, um, you can deduce that there are many three-term arithmetic regressions of primes. In fact, that there's nothing, so Erdős conjectured uh, both of these conjectures um, for not just arithmetic progressions of length three, but ar ar arithmetic progressions of any finite arbitrary length. Um, so the first conjecture, in other words, that if A contains no arithmetic progressions of length K, then A must have zero density. Um, that was a conjecture for a long time. Um, so it stood for about over 20 years since Roth proved the case for K equals three. Uh, indeed, it was a case that Roth um, spent quite a while and wrote a few papers on trying to solve, um, trying to improve his method to handle the general case, um, but he was unable to do so. But then in 1975, um, by quite a different method, by uh, basically sort of an entirely combinatorial method, um, Zemiradi proved what is now known as Zemiradi's theorem, which is the general case. So in other words, if A is a subset of the integers which doesn't contain um, K term arithmetic progressions for any fixed K, then A must have zero density. And this was a really um, influential proof. Um, so for example, Zemmerini's regularity lemma, which is one of the main tools now in um, graph theory, uh, was originally introduced by Zemmerini to prove uh, Zemmerini's theorem. <coughs> and since Zemmerini's original proof, there are in fact now um, several different proofs of Zemmerini's theorem. So um, with with pure combinatorics, with harmonic analysis now, with ergodic theory, um, with various blends of those techniques. Um, but the second harder conjecture is still wide open for the general case. So um, with the obviously Sask, we've proved this for k equals three, um, but the general case, it, Erdős has only conjectured it for any k, um, but it's still wide open. Um, even the case k equals four is quite open. So our methods don't really apply um, at all to any k bigger than three. And I believe, um, I sort of double checked this just before um, I came, that I think this is still the largest bounty of any surviving Erdős conjecture. I think $3,000 is the usual figure quoted for this. Okay, so that's sort of a very um, big picture overview of um, what the kind of result I'm talking about. Perhaps now is a good time to pause briefly in case there are any questions from anyone in the chat window or by the microphone. And I'll get a bit more specific and uh, technical in the next section. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So let's just fix what we're talking about. Three term arithmetic progression is just a set of three numbers, uh, x, x plus d and x plus 2d. So there was um, sort of a subtlety which I basically didn't mention at all before, which is that obviously if I allow the case d equals zero, then I mean every non-empty set contains a, a three-term arithmetic progression if you allow d equals zero. So that's not very interesting. So we sort of call those progressions trivial progressions. Um, so implicitly so far we've just been looking at non-trivial arithmetic progressions um, because counting trivial progressions is easy. Uh, in fact normally for the techniques that I'm going to be talking about it's most convenient to uh, count trivial progressions as well. And then at the, the very end, you then sort of say, well, right, I've counted, say, I've counted how many arithmetic progressions there are 
it's easy to count how many trivial progressions there are, so I'll just subtract that and then get the result. Um, so we're going to be talking about a few quantitative bounds, which is useful to introduce the following definition. So R of M is the largest possible size of a subset of the first N integers, which contains no non-trivial three-term progressions. Okay. Um, it's quite a fun exercise to work out the first few values of R of N. I don't know the largest N for which R of N is known explicitly, maybe around 30 odd, I forget. Certainly not that large. So with this definition, we can now state the erdos turan conjecture uh, it's just R of n equals little o of n. In other words, as n gets arbitrarily large, R of n is at most um, epsilon n for any epsilon bigger than zero. So incidentally, in, Roth's, in the um, original paper of Erdős and Turan, um, they actually proved the upper bound that basically R of n is the most three eighths of times n. Um, and Roth proved the Erdős and Turan conjecture in 1953, as I mentioned. Uh, he did this by adapting the circle method in analytic number theory, which had been introduced 30 odd years before that by um, Hardy and Ramanujan and, and Littlewood um, to study Waring's problem and Goldbach's problem. Um, I'm, I'm not assuming that anyone in the audience knows the circle method, um, so I, I won't really mention it much again for the rest of the talk. But if you do, if you are quite familiar with the circle method for other problems, but not for this, you might find it instructive to sort of compare what I'm saying against your sort of mental map of what the circle method is doing. Um, there's a lot of um, very close similarities. And in fact, one thing that analytic number theory is good at doing is improving quite explicit um, upper bounds. In particular, analytic, analytic number theory is good at providing lots of logs and log logs bounds. So when Roth proved uh, the qualitative upper bound of R of n being little o of n. In fact, his method sort of immediately gave quite an explicit quantitative upper bound of R of n is at most n over log log n. If you haven't seen this notation before, incidentally, uh, this is sort of sometimes known as the Vinogradov notation. This just means the inequality is true up to some absolute constant independent of n. Okay, so for all sufficiently large n, uh, Oh, sorry, there exists an absolute constant such that for all sufficiently large n, this inequality is true with a multiplicative constant. So Roth proved this n over log log n bound. And um, since then, in 1953, there was a sort of steady um, stream of further improvements to this quantitative upper bound. So I've tried to summarize the entire history on the next two slides. Um, so we begin with Roth in 1953, then there was some time before um, Zemeredi in 1986 found an improvement of this, so sort of um, somewhere between a power of log log and a power of log. And then Heath Brown, um, using sort of Zemeredi's method, um, actually sort of tweaked it to give, for the first time, a power of log. Okay, so Heath Brown um, and Zemeredi proved that R of n is big O of n over log n, to some constant c. Um, I think the, the constant c is actually not too bad. I think maybe Heath Brown gets one over 20 or something in his original paper, and you can um, maybe get one over five just by doing everything quite carefully. Uh, Zemeredi in 1990 then sort of tweaked that and sort of optimized the Heath Brown Zemeredi method sort of as far as it would go to give n over log n to the one quarter. Uh, but then their method reached the natural sort of barrier at that point. And um, then there was a, a gap before Borgan became interested in the problem and really uh, transformed it. So um, all of the ideas that, well, Borgan introduced quite a number of new ideas which have been really important, not just for Roth's theorem or studying three-term arithmetic progressions, but in fact, in the whole of uh, additive combinatorics and beyond. So in particular, this was the uh, place that, this was the argument in which Borgat introduced bore sets, um, which have now become sort of ubiquitous in many other areas. So if you're wondering where bore sets were first introduced, it was essentially by Borgat in this argument for Ross theorem. Um, sorry, there's a question in the chat. Um, are these all still weaker, th weaker than what you proved? Uh, yes, so um, in a couple of slides, I'll, I'll, I'll state the estimate that we proved, um, which is a direct improvement on all of these. 
So obviously all of these are uh, incremental. So something to stress is that somehow none of the progress in these would have been possible without the previous one. So it's not the case of, you know, each of these represents a completely new method. All of these basically take what everyone else did before and add at least one, sometimes several uh, new ideas combined with all of the really nice ideas that they came before to get even further. So um, it's a really, if, if I have the time, I think you have a long talk about the history of all, the, all these ideas and they're really beautiful ideas. And it's really nice that somehow no good idea is wasted, right? So everybody needs all the good ideas of everything that came before, plus some new ones. And our work, um, my work with Olofsky Sass is certainly no different in that respect. So uh, Borgan then improved his estimate to log n over log n to the two thirds. So now we're seeing improvement of the exponent of this log. Um, Sanders uh, then improved this to log n to the three quarters. And then sort of the next really big threshold was reached by Tom Sanders in 2011, when he basically proved n over log n. Okay, with some powers of log log. So just shy of n over log n, but basically n over log n. Um, and then progress sort of stalled around this barrier for a while. Uh, so in 2014, I gave an alternative proof of n over log n um, with slightly different log log behavior. Uh, and then last year <clears throat> with Olofsky Sask, we came up with a third proof um, that used some of the same ideas, but also some quite different ideas. And then earlier this year, I think in, in May, possibly this year, uh, Thomas Schoen um, further improved some of these arguments to improve the log log a little bit more. So the best, you know, best bound previously stood at uh, Schoen's 2020 result of uh, log log n to the third power essentially over log n times n. Um, so our actual main result, so I mentioned this thing about the sum of the reciprocals, that's sort of a corollary of our main result, which is this bound, which is that actually r of n is big O of n over log n to the one plus c, where c is greater than zero, definitely greater than zero, uh, and it is an absolute constant. Okay, so it's, it's completely independent of n and in particular, this is um, little o of n over log n. So sort of the significance of this bound is really that it breaks past this n over log n barrier that these previous approaches had sort of stalled at. And you really need to get past the n over log n barrier to deduce this about the sum of reciprocals. So it's quite a nice elementary analysis exercise that sort of the sum, essentially, the sum of reciprocals diverges if and only if you have density sort of n over log n or bigger. Okay, so we really need to get little o of n over log n to um, deduce this about the uh, corollary about the sum of reciprocals. Okay, so the, naturally you're all wondering, okay, so what is this constant c? Um, is it sort of maybe a one half or one or maybe it's like a third or whatever? Unfortunately, it's very, very small. It is in principle effectively computable. Um, we're not sort of using anything weird or in their argument. Um, the only reason we're not writing down exactly what it is, is because it's a real pain to keep track of, right? It's sort of the number of Cauchy Schwartz's in this argument, which is, which is a few. And then, you know, it's just, if we wrote, kept track of the constant all the way through the paper, rather than being 70 odd pages, would be like 180 odd pages and would be much, much harder to read. Um, a back of the envelope calculation suggests that it probably, if you really cared and kept track of the constant, you could get maybe two to the minus two to the two to the 1000, um, which is definitely bigger than zero, uh, but only just. So um, certainly to get any reasonable constant out of this, like C equals one half or C equals one, um, you would need to change our argument quite significantly. Um, so certainly, I don't encourage anyone to really work out in detail what this constancy should be. You, your time would be much better spent to actually just coming up with an improvement on the argument itself. Um, sorry, uh, there's a question. Is there a known conjecture lower bound for R of n? Uh, yes, there is um, both, and I'll mention that in a couple of the slides. Uh, so the particular type of bound, so this n over log n to the one plus some ridiculously small constant, might look surprising if you're new to the area. Uh, but in fact, sort of for those who work on this problem, it wasn't really a surprise the form of this bound 
because it was a closely mim closely mimicked a previous result of 2010 by Bateman and Katz. So that result was on the cap set problem, which is essentially the same problem. So how big can a set be without three term arithmetic progressions? But rather than in F3 to rather than in the integers, we look at in F3 to the n. So that's just the uh, n dimensional vector space over F3, which is essentially sort of somehow algebraically the simplest possible group that you can really ask about three term progressions in. And they proved a band looks very similar. So here, obviously, uh, three to the little n is the analog of our capital n. It's the size of our universe that we're working in. Um, and they prove that if a subset of f3 to the n has no three-term progressions, then it's almost three to the n over n to the one plus c. Where again, c is absolutely tiny. Uh, in fact, their argument probably gives something even worse than the c that I gave by maybe a couple of extra levels from the exponent. Um, so the use of f3 to the n is sort of fairly uh, common now in, added, in the added, in additive combinatorics as a model setting for NFM the integers because we expect that, well, somehow they're roughly both finite abelian groups. Okay, the integers are essentially finite when you, have to, when you work with finite sets. Um, and in, but because f3 to the n has so much more algebraic structure, has subspaces available and things like that, um, we expect that it's a lot easier to work with and so first we should try and solve the problem in F3 to the n and then work out how to generalize those methods so that they work for the integers as well. And this was part of the motivation for Bateman and Katz um, for working on the cap set problem and especially because they used Fourier analytic techniques and we can do Fourier analysis over F3 to the n, we can also do it over the integers so it sort of raised the hope that um, using their sort of ideas, you could prove a similar sort of bound for the integers. Um, and it very much is, this is very much what um, Olaf and I have done. So we are, we again, just like all these previous quantitative improvements, we basically use all of the ideas in the integers. Um, so from uh, Heath Brown, Semerady, Roth, Morgan, Sanders, uh, and then also these ideas of Beck and Katz from looking at the cap set problem. And then, and again, uh, our result wouldn't have been possible without the breakthrough uh, ideas of Bateman and Katz. Um, and we also had to come up with several completely new ideas as well. Um, there was some hope, I think, just after the Bateman Katz paper came out that maybe um, this sort of translation from F3 to the integers could be done quite quickly. Maybe it wouldn't be too bad. Uh, in fact, the, the translation that were proved more difficult, I think, than people expected. So about 10 years before we were able to complete it. Uh, the story has an interesting turn here because in the 10 years between this Bateman and Katz band coming out and uh, this year, for F3 to the M, for the Katz step problem, a completely different method has done much, much better than the Bateman and Katz bound with a much simpler proof. So in, um, I think, 2016, Krutlev and Pach introduced a new polynomial method to additive combinatorics, which I think maybe two weeks or so after the Krutlev and Pach paper appeared on the archive, uh, Ellenberg and Hoswitz used it to prove the upper bound of uh, basically 2.7 something to the n. So in particular, sort of an exponential saving um, over the trivial bound. So this is much, much better than the Bateman and Katz bound of 3 to the n over some polynomial in n. Unfortunately, they did it with this polynomial method, and the polynomial method makes heavy use of the fact that F3 to the n is very algebraic, right? We have fixed characteristic and very high rank. The characteristic is very small compared to the size of our group. Whereas if you look at the integers, it's basically the opposite. Uh, we have rank one and infinite characteristic. And maybe there is a way to get some sort of polynomial method to work for Roth for three term progression to the integers, but certainly I have no idea how that um, would go. I don't think anyone um, on the planet has an idea at the moment. Um, unlike the previous work of Bateman and Katz using Fourier analysis, which uh, because we have a fairly comfortable grasp of Fourier analysis, we know how to do Fourier analysis over the integers, it, people are a lot more optimistic that uh, the Bateman and Katz method could be adapted to the integers rather than this polynomial method being adapted to the integers. Um, okay, so now I'll, I'll answer the question about lower bounds for R of n. So certainly 
the upper band of n over log n to the one plus c of some tiny c, that's not going to be the correct answer. Right? There is no fair universe where that's the actual size of r of n. So you might ask, okay, so how big should r of n be? Uh, the best lower bound that we have, um, rather embarrassingly, hasn't really been improved in uh, what's that sort of over 70 years, 75 years almost. And it was due to Behrens in 1946. There have been a couple of tweaks of Behrens' original method by Elkin and Green and Wolf, um, but they don't really change the form of the bound, which is that R of n is at least n times exponential in minus square root log n. Okay, so in particular that is uh, much sparser than any arbitrary power of log for a density. Okay, so that's sort of much smaller than r than n over log n to the 100, for example, or 1000 to 1 million or whatever. So the best lower bound that we have is much, much smaller than the current upper bound. <clears throat> uh, we believe, so Olaf and I believe that the lower bound is closer to the truth. Uh, this is not a controversial conjecture, although actually to my knowledge I don't think anyone's sort of conjectured it uh, in print uh, before our paper, but certainly it's sort of one of these folklore conjectures that if you ask people who thought about the problem how big do you think R of n is, then I think most people would probably have said this. So we conjecture that the um, sort of the correct size of R of n is basically n times e to the minus log n for some constant c greater than zero. Um, so Behrens lower bound says that certainly c has to be at most one half. Uh, a strong conjecture might be that c equals a half is possible. Um, I think certainly I personally go back and forth on different days about whether I really believe that c equals one half is possible. Um, I think maybe c equals one third is probably a safer conjecture. Um, but definitely something like c equals 1 over 100 or something should be very safe. I would be immensely surprised if it was worse than that. But that's the conjecture. So certainly the correct scale of R of n is much smaller than the, the, the lower upper bounds that we know how to prove currently. Okay, so that sort of concludes the introduction about the statement. And now in the other half of the talk, I'm going to talk about uh, the proof itself. Um, I'm going to keep things at a very high level. Um, in particular, I won't get into, bogged down in any of the quantitative technical um, calculations. If you are in, more interested in, in hearing more about the proof, um, in July, possibly in August, I figure, um, I gave a sort of a long talk in the webinar for additive combinatorics about this result, uh, which is available on YouTube. So if you Google um, my name and theorem or something in YouTube, uh, it will come up. Uh, which is essentially sort of a, a, a version of this half of the talk, but going into um, some more detail. And then if you want more detail than that, then you can look at the paper itself uh, on the archive. So the basic framework of the proof um, and sort of the fact that it uses Fourier analysis in a very fundamental way, and what's called a density increment argument, uh, these both go back all the way to Roth in the 1950s. So all of the um, previous quantitative bounds that I mentioned in that table, they all use both of these ideas. They use Fourier analysis and density increment. I should mention, by the way, that for the proof of the qualitative statement, that R of n equals a little o of n, there are now several uh, quite different proofs known. There's purely combinatorial proofs. There's one uh, using some triangle removal lemma, which uses thin radius regularity lemma in turn. Uh, there's proofs using ergodic theory, just like thin radius theorem. Um, but all these other proofs do quite badly in the quantitative side, right? So they give R of n equal to little o of n, but certainly nothing close to R of n uh, being at most like n over log n to the one tenth or something. So for that, you still need Fourier analysis and density increment. So what's the big idea of um, how a density increment argument works? We're going to exploit um, a randomness versus structure dichotomy. And the dichotomy goes something like this. So we have some set A of integers. And we want to understand, oh, what, what do we know about A? We know that it's a subset of the integers 1 up to n. And we know its size. We know it's relatively big. And that's all we know about A. And we have to somehow deduce from that that A contains a three-term arithmetic progression. So the idea is there is this following dichotomy. Either A um, behaves 
like a bit like a random set in the sense that A has many three-term arithmetic progressions, right? Random sets contain many three-term arithmetic progressions, simple probabilistic calculation. So if A behaves like a random set, it has arithmetic progressions. If A doesn't behave like a random set, then we expect that A should behave like a structured set. And structured sets, we also expect to have arithmetic progressions. The kind of structure that's relevant for us here is saying that A has a density increment, right? So basically, I want to find some arithmetic progression along one inside one up to n, it's called a p, such that the relative density of a inside p is bigger than the relative density of a inside my original interval. Okay, but then because what is an arithmetic progression is just an interval one up to n primed, which has been translated and dilated, and the existence of three term progressions is invariant in the translation and dilation, um, I can just do the whole thing again, right? I just now look at zoom in and look at a intersect p and replace one up to m with p and do the whole argument again. But the point is we can't continue this forever so at each point either we're finding some three-term progressions or we're increasing the density and the density can't exceed one, right? that's just trivial. So at some point we must, must actually end in the first case with a three-term progression. Now, this is a very qualitative sketch, so I haven't really mentioned at all that what the actual final quantitative bound that you'll get for R of n following this procedure is, and I'm not going to do any of those calculations for this talk. But it's clear that there's two parameters that are really important here. So the first is how much did the density of A increase at each stage? Um, because that affects how many times I have to run this whole argument for, right? So like if I'm going from alpha up to two alpha each time, then I only need to run sort of log in alpha many times before I exceed one, which is great. On the other hand, the other parameter is how much have I lost in the size of my progression? So I'm going from one up to n down to p, how much smaller is that progression, right? Because in the worst case, maybe I've gone from one up to n to a progression of just length one, and that tells me essentially nothing. I want to make sure p is still pretty big. Okay, so there's two parameters to play off. Um, how much has density gone up? So the more the better, and how much has the progression gone down? So the, the less the better. And basically you, you feed in whatever best uh, sort of bound you can get for both these parameters in, and then you turn the handle and you do the um, iteration, and then the final bound for R of n pops out. Okay, so let's talk about how this, um, in, this randomness versus structured dichotomy actually works. We want to show either there are many three-term progressions or A has some structure, which, is, which we can then find a density increment from. The first step, and again, this is basically the same as the circle method, is to use orthogonality in characters to write the count of three-term progressions, this is what we're interested in, as um, a sum in Fourier space. Okay, so let's pretend that one up to n is a finite to group of order n. It basically is, you replace it with the cyclic group z mod nz if you're uncomfortable with that. <clears throat> and then recall that for any finite abelian group, I have a dual group um, g hat of characters gamma, which are just homomorphisms from the group to the unit circle. That's also a finite abelian group, which is certainly isomorphic to g. So by orthogonality of characters, I can write the count of three term progressions in A, which is just the left hand side here, as sort of an average um, over this sum involving gamma. So this sort of one over n sum over gamma of x plus y minus two z is just detecting when x, y, and z lie in a three-term arithmetic progression. Um, in other words, I can write this as if I define the Fourier transform of A by just one hat A is just the average um, of gamma of x over all x inside A, then the number of three-term progressions is just this sort of basic cubic sum um, of the Fourier transform of A. You can ignore the minus two here. We can replace that. Basically, think of this as the sum of the Fourier transform of A cubed. Okay, so there's a bunch of characters here. I don't really know anything about any of them except at the trivial character. The trivial character is where gamma of x is just identically equal to one. Um, then I know exactly what the Fourier transform is there. It's equal to alpha, which is the density of A, so the size of A divided by n. Um, and sort of, again, that's basically all I really know about A is the density alpha. So I better hope to do something with the rest. Um, so the trivial character contributes alpha cubed basically to that sum total. 
and that's we expect that to be the main term that's sort of in a random set that's all that's contributing and the rest will sort of oscillate randomly and cancel each other out so the number of three term progressions of any set a i can write as alpha cubed and then squared which is a reasonably big main term and then plus something i'm going to think of as the error term which is basically the sum of the um, cube of the Fourier transform of a in particular if there are any three trivial three term progressions in other words if we fail this first part of the uh, randomness versus structure dichotomy uh, then we have very few progressions the main term must be cancelled out by the error term and if you sort of plug in the parameters um, then uh, you get that the sum of the Fourier transform cubed is at least alpha cubed up to constants and there's a question here does this hold for k-term arithmetic progressions um, essentially uh, the brief answer is no not as I've written it um, you can express a k-term arithmetic progression as a series so rather than back here where I express the three-term progression as a solution to sort of one linear equation x plus y equals 2z instead so one equation and three variables for a k-term progression you then have k variables and k minus two equations so you can write sort of some down you can write some sort of expression down as an average over I guess k minus two copies of g hat um, but everything breaks down very quickly after that point uh, you can't really use characters we have now a good idea about what to use instead it's sort of called higher order for analysis and then one uses sort of Gower's uniformity norms and quadratic characters and things like that instead uh, but that theory is much more sort of much less well developed than Fourier analysis so there is a, an analog a higher order analog of this for k-term progressions but somehow it breaks down much earlier um, okay so we know that if we're not in the random case we have few error three, three term progressions then we have some sort of structure in that the sum of my Fourier transform cubed is big at least alpha cubed Okay, now we can do some combinatorial tricks to the sum, which I won't bother detailing in this talk. But the key idea is that we're going to isolate the contribution from large Fourier coefficients. So this is in introduces the following object, which is very important. The eta large spectrum of A is just a set of all characters gamma, so that the absolute value of the Fourier transform, so the size of the Fourier coefficient at gamma, is at least eta times alpha. So alpha is the maximum, just by the triangle inequality. So eta is some par parameter between zero and one. So it just measures sort of how much of the maximum possible size is this um, Fourier coefficient. And all right, so by dyadic pigeonholing and a couple of combinatorial tricks, um, you can convert this cubic um, assumption at the top of the slide into saying there is some eta between one and alpha. So that the size of the eta level spectrum is at least eta to the minus three. We have no control at all over where, what eta that happens with. But somehow it's a trade-off, right? If this happens at eta very large, then our lower bound for our size is very bad. But on the other hand, the um, lower, si lower bound for the size of our Fourier coefficients is very big. Okay. Or there might be a trade-off and maybe the size of our Fourier coefficients has gone down, maybe something like alpha squared, but now we have loads of them. Okay. So we either have, maybe we have very few co Fourier coefficients, but all of which are really big, or we have absolutely loads of Fourier coefficients, which are of sort of medium size. So, so far we've shown that either A has many three term progressions or there is some level of eta between one and alpha so that we have roughly eta to the minus three many Fourier coefficients which are large sort of on scale eta. Okay so the next step is we want to convert the second point here into a density increment if you recall so the first part a has many three term progressions that's sort of the randomness part of our dichotomy the second part is um, the sort of structural part that we want to turn into a density increment so how do we find such a progression in which a has increased density there are a number of ways um, i won't go into the details um, in fact sort of there's basically one of the main innovations of the Heath Brands Emirati approach, for example, was to introduce a new L2 uh, based method. Uh, Borgan introduced a new N affinity based method where he replaced progressions with more sets. And we sort of use, in fact, a combination of both of those methods. But the key takeaway is um, to find a good progression, so a progression that's not too small, on which A has big density, 
um, you can essentially convert it into asking for a subset of the eta level spectrum, which is big, which has small dimension. Um, here, dimension you can think of probably as you most, might most naively interpret if I said, what do I mean by the dimension of a set of integers? Um, I, you, for example, I mean the size of the minimal spanning set. Okay, so it's just a set of um, a subset such that I can represent everything inside that set by sort of plus minus one uh, linear combinations of things from that set. Okay, or if you think of A as being a subset of F3 to the N, for example, then it's just dimension in sort of the uh, dimension of the containing subspace. Uh, and roughly the idea is then we take P, this progression, to be a set which basically annihilates this subset of the spectrum that I found. A yeah, small co-dimension, in other words, so that P is large, but it captures a lot of the altitude Fourier mass of A, and you can turn that into a density increment. That's sort of details for those who want it. The main takeaway is, at this point, the hard part is to find a subset of the eta level spectrum, which is large size and small dimension. And then the rest is turning the technical, the handle of the technical machine, which has been well developed by Morgan and Roth and these brands over here and others. So there are two parameters to balance here. So there's how large a subset of the spectrum can we find and how small its dimension is. And this exactly mirrors the two parameters in the density increment procedure that I mentioned before, right? So how large the subset, so how, how large the subset of the spectrum we have directly controls how much the density of A goes up by. So the more the better, right? The bigger uh, the set of Fourier coefficients I found, uh, the bigger a density increment of A that translates into. And how small its dimension is controls how much we've lost in the progression at each stage. Okay, so the less the better. So that's sort of how these two parameters are determined. Okay, so what's the first natural thing? So as I said before, the whole point is that I found some eta so that the size of the eta level spectrum is at least e to the minus three. The most obvious thing to do is I'll say, oh, I'll just take that whole set. So now I have size e to the minus three, that's pretty big. And dimension, well, trivially, every set is spanned by itself. Let's just say the dimension is at most e to the minus three. Uh, I mean, that gives you a non-trivial bound. You can sort of run that through the technical machinery and it would give you in the end a bound of n over log n to the one third. Okay. Um, so the first natural question is, right, we want to improve this to getting past n over log n. Um, all right, let's leave the size alone for now. Can we do better than the dimension bound? So in that, in the previous bullet point, we just used the trivial idea that a set is spanned by itself, but we surely we can expect to do better than that because we're not dealing with any old random set we're dealing with a set which came from um came arose in quite a structured way right this was a set of large Fourier coefficients of some reasonably dense subset of the integers um so it's not sort of a random arbitrary set that's given to us it's a set that's generated in quite a structured way so we might expect that this trivial dimension bound can be improved um, and the answer is yes, it can. Um, I think the first to really observe this in this context was Chang. Um, she wasn't um, thinking about Roth's theorem. She was working towards improving the bounds of uh, Freiman's theorem, which are another important aspect of additive combinatorics. But for our purpose, Chang basically proved a lemma in her paper, which we can state roughly as the following. So the spectrum, the eta level spectrum of A has dimension big O eta to the minus two essentially it's a dense subset of A. And this is basically true for any eta, any A which is reasonably dense, right? So this is nothing about three turn progressions anymore. This is just a fact about what sets that come as spectrum must look like. Um, okay, so I'll skip over the sketch proof there, but if you, if you want, you can have a look at the slides later and think about that sort of bullet point sketch. Okay, so now let's just apply that to our situation. We still have size eta to the minus three, and now we have to mention eta to the minus two by using Chang's lemma. Running this argument, you should expect that you get a better bound for R of n, right? We've got we a strictly better situation now, the same size and a smaller dimension. And indeed we get R of n being basically n over log n to the one half. This was not Borgan's argument. <coughs> uh, Borgan used a slightly different argument, um, but this is an alternative way to get n over log n to the one half. 
Now, you might ask, okay, can we do better than Chang's lemma? Can we improve this easier to the minus two dimension bound? Uh, unfortunately, uh, Ben Green has proved that the answer is no, you cannot improve Chang's lemma. So Green constructed set A, such that the eta level spectrum of A has size eta to the minus two and dimension eta to the minus two. Right, so they're pretty small, but they're not spanned by any subset, essentially. So in particular, I can't improve this big O of eta to the minus two uh, dimension bound of Chang's lemma. But this is not actually the situation we're in. We know that we're not in one of, we haven't run into a spectrum, which is one of Green's sort of bad counter examples, because we know that the spectrum has size eta to the minus three, which is much bigger than Green's example. Um, so then we ask, well, can we improve the dimension bound from Chang's lemma if we're prepared to lose some of the size? So before I kept the size at eta to the minus three and tried to push the dimension down. What if instead I'm prepared to lose some of the size, so that's a loss, but I win by pushing the dimension down even further? And the answer is yes, you can in fact prove such an improvement of Chang's lemma. So this was basically the, um, the driving force behind my n over log n bound in 2014. So if any spectrum A, you can pass to a, a subset of sort of proportion eta, but dimension is big O eta to the minus one. So you can improve Chang's lemma if you're prepared to pass to a, a reasonably large subset of the spectrum. And again, I'll skip the proof. The idea is sort of you combine the proof of Chang's lemma and with some random sampling. Okay, so let's just sort of plug this lemma in instead. So now we have a size of e e a set in the spectrum of size e to the minus two and dimension e to the minus one. <laughs> okay, so the size has gone down by a factor of eta, so it's bad, but the dimension's also gone down by a factor of eta, which is good. And it turns out when you plug it into the machinery, you turn the handle and that's actually a win for you. That, that's a trade you're happy to make. And you get n over log n, but not past. Okay, so how can we do better? How can we get past n over log n? Um, can we improve on this lemma? Again, no, you can sort of construct examples by building up Green's examples, such that this lemma is best possible. So now the question we really ask is, okay, so what does such a set actually look like? If I have a set of, if I have a spectrum, delta sub eta of a, I know it's large, a size eta to the minus three, and I know its dimension in various subsets. Um, this is a com now a sort of a completely general question, so you can think of it in the following terms. Um, you're just given a set delta inside some group. Pick your favorite finite Boolean group, maybe F2 to the N, to keep things simple. And let's say there's some parameter capital K, so that delta is size K cubed. It also has dimension K squared. In other words, it's not spanned. Um, it's spanned by a subset of itself of size roughly k squared. Also, I know that every subset of size k squared has dimension um, at least k. Okay, so what can such a set delta actually look like? So you can play around with examples in F2 to the n, and after a while you come up with the following sort of construction, which is if I take a subgroup of size roughly k, and then sort of orthogonally add on a, a bunch of random noise of size k squared. So that some set will have size k cubed, and you can check that it has the dimension properties that I said before. Um, really, so this was, I think, the, the brilliant insight from the, the breakthrough part of the work of Bateman and Katz, which is they realized that actually this is basically it. This is kind of the only such example of a set with these sort of dimensional properties. And they proved this. So they showed, and this was sort of the, the key, uh, most difficult part of their paper, that in F3 to the N, we can assume um, that our spectrum actually has this structure, right? So we not only are saying, we're no longer saying fairly mysterious statements about there exists some big chunk of my spectrum with small dimension. I'm actually saying the whole spectrum I can decompose quite nicely as H plus X, where H is basically a subgroup of size e to the minus one, and x is a, a randomish set of size e to the minus two. Okay, so I now have much more information about what my spectrum must look like. Uh, again, I think arguably the hardest part of my paper with sort of CSASC is we prove a structural result like this. Um, we have to prove a version, obviously not for F3 to the end, but basically one that works for arbitrary abelian groups in particular can be integers. 
which is a whole host of um, extra difficulties. And roughly speaking, we prove a similar sort of decomposition. Okay, so are we done? Um, well, we want, how does this decomposition help us? Uh, on the one hand, we can look at H. So H is a subgroup, so it has dimension basically one, or it's like log the size of H. Um, and size roughly e to the minus one. So again, we've lost a factor of beta in the size, and we've lost a factor of beta in the dimension. And before when we did this, we went from R of n being at most n over square root log n to R n over log n. So we might hope that you know this is further a trade-off we're happy to make, but it turns out that unfortunately you just get n over log n again. Right. So when I start pushing my size below e to the minus two, um, making trade-offs for the dimension doesn't help. They exactly cancel each other out past that point. Um, so that alone, this structural result alone is not enough. You need some further way to exploit this decomposition. Bateman and Katz have, um, in their original paper, they came up with a way to exploit this solution that works when you're dealing with F3 to the n. Uh, roughly speaking, the idea is you, instead of looking at h, you look at h plus x primed, where x primed is some kind of subset of x, so that the, the size of this is now bigger, the dimension's bigger, and you can sort of tweak that and balance that off, trade that off against each other to get some win, which is just past the log-in barrier. Um, unfortunately, that trick doesn't work in the integers um, for, for quite fundamental reasons. Um, you need an alternative way of getting it. Basically, you can still do this trade-off, but the trade-off doesn't win you anything anymore in the integers, right? There's just, uh, it's a much less rigid structure, uh, so there's much less um, algebra around if you like to take advantage of. So instead, um, Olaf, Sisask and I came up with a new technique which we call spectral boosting. Um, so really sort of the, the two big inputs of our paper are proving this bateman cat style structural decomposition that works for the integers, and then this new technique called spectral boosting, which allows us to exploit that structure. Um, and so now instead of, you know, looking at h plus x prime or changing what set we're looking at, uh, we're just still going to still work with h, right? We're not going to try and make it any bigger. So still size e to the minus one dimension one, because that's great. Dimension one is the most additively structured thing you can imagine. We're very happy with that. The problem is the size isn't big enough. Um, Instead of changing the size, we actually change the sort of the parameter which has been following us throughout, but we haven't really mentioned about changing it, which is the eta. Right? So in other words, the what level of spectrum is H a subset of? Um, it turns out, and this is really the, the big thing which makes the whole argument work, is that there is a quite a, an elementary sort of combinatorial argument. So basically sort of you do Cauchy-Schwartz in physical space, then you do Cauchy-Schwartz in Fourier space, and you bounce back and forth a couple of times to boost the spectral level. So we can actually um, morally say that H is not only a subset of delta sub eta, the eta level spectrum, which we knew from the beginning, but in fact it's a subset of the eta to the one half level spectrum, right, which is bigger. <clears throat> so the size is the same, the dimension is the same, but now we know that the Fourier coefficients inside H are actually significantly larger than we might naively have guessed. That's a big win. Um, and that would actually give something like a really good bare end style upper bound of R of n big O of uh, e to the minus log n to the c times n, some constant c. Okay. Unfortunately, that's not the bound we proved, um, basically because of there's a weakness in the structural part. So somehow, again, think of our proof as we prove this structural result for spectra, and then we have the spectral boosting to deal with the structure that that spits out. The spectral boosting part is absolutely brilliant. Um, it's quantitatively, there's essentially no loss in there. It works exactly as we want it to. The spectral boosting part, um, part of it worked quite well, part of what we're forced to use, uh, basically relatively crude pigeonholing, um, sort of some combinatorial iteration arguments, which um, are quite ugly, they make the argument quite messy, and they make the bounds that you get quite poor as well. And in particular, they mean that we can't necessarily always prove a kind of structural decomposition. Sometimes you might have to exit with some much weaker structure instead, which fortunately still are enough to get past the log barrier, but no longer enough to prove the sort of bare end style of the bound. And that's really the reason we get only a tiny bit past the log barrier, is the weaknesses in the structural decomposition. 
Um, okay, so that's probably all I'll, I'll say about the proof uh, in this talk, unless of course there are further questions. So thank you very much for your attention and any uh, questions. Thanks for the nice talk. So, any questions for Thomas? Uh, so, a question where does KAP fail essentially? Um, so, in a sense, okay, so one way to view it is that what we're exploiting in the three term progression case is that if I don't contain the right number of three-term progressions, then I must have a few large Fourier coefficients. Um, actually, Gowers, in his work on Zemrady's theorem, showed that that's not true for four-term progressions. So he constructs sets um, such that for four-term progressions, they don't contain the right number. In fact, they contain uh, much fewer than the right number number of four-term progressions, but from the point of view of their Fourier coefficients, they're all really small. They all behave completely like a random set. Okay, so from the point of view of um, the characters, Fourier analysis, they don't, you, you can't distinguish that from a random set, even though it contains hardly any four-term uh, four arithmetic progressions. Um, it's hard to say exactly where the argument sort of fails, because it fails at so many points. If you like, um, Think about Parseval's identity, for example. Parseval's identity is the most fundamental foundation of Fourier analysis, and it basically result, revolves around the fact that I'm counting solutions to the easy linear equation x minus y equals zero, and I can do that with Fourier analysis. Um, there is no real proper analog of Parseval's identity for um, the higher order coefficient, higher order characters that you need to measure um, longer progressions. So even at the Parseval's identity stage, uh, we are we're not really understanding what's going on. Right? So to sort of to, to, to count four term progressions, you can use these things called quadratic characters, which essentially serve like e to the two pi i x times alpha. I'm looking at e to the two pi i x squared times alpha, for example, um, which gives me a whole other dimension of um, things to look at, but um, they're much less well understood. Uh, Tao does have a, a whole book about the subject, in fact, called Higher Order for Analysis, uh, which I highly recommend. Um, and, and this sort of approach is what Gowers used to prove Severini's theorem, so it's to prove some good quantitative bounds on the corresponding thing for Tau, yes, Terry Tau. Um, for k term progressions, there are reasonably good quantitative upper bounds known for k term progressions, like a power of log log, which were done by Gowers um, by creating this sort of technology. But again, sort of the, the state of affairs is, is very much the power of log log rather than the power of log that we need for the Erdős conjecture. Personally, in fact, I, I'm not entirely convinced that the Erdős conjecture is true. Um, I think it's sort of definitely true for k equals three and k equals four, but I wouldn't be incredibly surprised if it turned out to be false for k equals five equals five even. I wouldn't be surprised if it was true either. I just uh, much less confident, I guess, in it for longer progressions. Well, so we got for Thomas. Excellent, nice talk. Okay, thank you very much. That's very excellent. I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.